Hi everyone, it's me, the Caduzzi. <laughs> and here we are for another episode of the Caduzzi cast. Caduzzi. And today, alright, first of all, I don't even know how to say your last name. I'm here with... Jules. Is it Faber? Faber, Faber. Um, well, if you're friends, it's Jules Faber. Jules Faber. Jules Faber. Um, but um, all throughout school, it's been Jules Faber. Jules Faber. Jules Faber. I can say that with my yes. Boston accent. Yeah, for bright. I want to say fucking Jules for bright. <laughs> Jules fucking for bright, kid. <laughs> I really wanted to say that. It's fucking Jules. He's a yoga teacher. You know him? Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm laughing because I find it funny that I come from where I come from and that I'm totally into yoga now. It's kind of kooky but people listen to me it's funny when I tweet about it and everything they do mm-hmm. listen to me oh. they must see it in me I think they see it in me they see the change the shift yeah they the see the peace it, it's peace but also fun ah oh, peaceful fun yes that's key because I think if it was just peace it'd that's, be boring well halfway I think that's be, halfway it could be boring yeah. right because people like I feel, I find they're more attracted to the fun even more than the peace. Yeah. But I don't know that they're mutually exclusive. I think that a lot of people that are very peaceful have a good sense of humor. Yes, because it's a sense of confidence, too. Yeah. And so you need... And you have space, right? To make a good joke, you got to have a little bit of space to... You can't be filled up with what you know. Yes, and you can't be so self-aware. Exactly. If you're really self-aware, it's not as funny. Or maybe people laugh, but... At you. Yeah, it's not the same, <laughs> like, the same. hilarious, deep, deep, hilarious no, laugh. surface laughter. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you've gotten so far from the conversation that Jules <laughs> fucking Faber. Jules fucking Faber. <laughs> <laughs> is a yoga teacher, but he's more than a yoga teacher. You've been doing yoga for, you were born yoga, right? So I, was, I was born with my feet behind my head, which was really <laughs> uncomfortable for my mom. <laughs> But, what do um, they call that? That's not breach. That's uh, ass first. Ass first. I don't. I don't know much about um, birthing lingo. It's but breach if you're upside down. If you breach if, up, if your first. feet are coming out first. So it's something in the middle. Well, something in the middle because of my ass out first. We'll just say he's ass out. Just ass out. <laughs> not much has changed. In okay, where were you years. born? First of all, your mother and father. Uh, no, just your mom. Who's a yogi? Um, my mom's a yoga teacher. Yeah. Uh, my dad is slightly the opposite of yoga. He, what he is. He's a carpenter. My dad was a carpenter. Oh, too. really? Yeah, he's he's a carpenter, and um, he's a really king intense guy. He's intense. <laughs> he's so intense. Uh, he's intense in a good way most of the time, but not always. Yeah. Yeah. Deep. It just got sad. No, it's not sad. It's the truth. <laughs> like, I thought that was... The reason why I was quiet is because it's very poignant. Like, yeah. Everything isn't always good. No. I mean, it's interesting. He's spent a decent amount of time in and out of jail and out on the streets. And so I've been able to see that part in addition to the yoga world. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Mm, yeah. So I get to see a little bit of both, you know? Do you want to tell us why he was in jail or... Um, well, which time? <laughs> <laughs> you really should be from Boston. <laughs> which time? Most people would be like, oh, I have to be very careful. You're like, oh, which time? Yeah, I'll tell you. No, no. <laughs> well, um, what, any of the times. Whatever you any feel of the times. Uh, I think he's been in for uh, robbery, and he's been in for drugs, um, for... Uh, he was helping run an after-hours spot for a couple of years that he went to jail for. So, numerous things. But they all probably stemmed from the drugs. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so, was that since you were little? All right, so where were you born? Let's start from the beginning. I was, I was born in Manhattan. Um, some hospital uptown. I'm not... <laughs> you don't even know? I don't even know. Uh-uh. December 7th. I know the day that I was born. All right, so you know your birthday. That's and good. somewhere, there's a hospital that I'm sure people know it's next to Fairway. Up know. on the Upper West Side? Yeah. What hospital is that? There's a hospital on the Upper West Side? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm going to have to... If I had an assistant, we could have yeah. them get on it right now and tell me. But since it's a one-man band here... Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to Google it and tweet it when I tweet the uh, podcast. Jules was born in. I do everything myself, so... All right. I guess I could Google it on my phone. But you'd have to keep talking while I was Googling. All right. All right so you were born on the Upper West Side? I was born on the Upper West Side somewhere. Um... In the hospital, uh, different from my brother who was born in our apartment. What? 
Yep, my mom did a home birth. Oh, on purpose? I, yeah, on purpose. And um, then she was like, is your brother older or younger? Younger. Oh, so yeah. she did that after you. He's seven years younger than me. Lennox um, Hill? No. That's Upper um, East Side. That's Upper East Side. Cornell? Presbyterian? Yeah. That's it? Mm-hmm. I did it. Look at me. I can, I can Google. I can talk. I think, I think I'm pretty sure that's it. It's something Presbyterian. Yeah. <clears throat> New York Presbyterian Hospital. All right. There you have it. There you go. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So that's where Jules... Google born. saves the day. Father was born. All right. So first of all, how many kids? Uh, two. Me and my brother. And then I have a much younger half-sister. My same dad, different mom. Same dad, different mom. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you were born... In the Presbyterian. And so was your mom a yoga instructor back then? No, she was a public school teacher. Aww. Aww. So she taught pre-K and K. Wow, Aww. that's a double off. <laughs> double off. <laughs> um, and we lived on 4th Street and Avenue D. Um, oh. oh. Back in the day. Back when in the day like, 80s. Back in the 80s. That's when it was like... A little rough. Yeah? Yeah, a little rough. Lower East Side. Lower East Side. Lower East Side. Yeah, it was interesting. Like, our building didn't have a door on the front of it. And, like, dude was selling uh, heroin down the block or and inside the building. It was an interesting time. Hmm. Uh, we had two big dogs that we lived with. A German Shepherd and some other kind of big dog to keep all the, the naughty people out. I was going to say, for protection, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't that interesting? That's what a public school <clears throat> teacher's salary. What was your dad around then or no? No, he was around. He was a carpenter in the Carpenters Union. Oh, my Those, dad was the secretary oh, treasurer of the hey. Carpenters Union in Boston. That's crazy. He's um he still has visions of going back into the Carpenters Union. He's I'm like sure. he's like fifty something years old. <laughs> one of these he's like, days. one of these days I'm gonna get my union card again, I'm gonna be in there. I'm like, all right. <laughs> That's always <laughs> you do it. Aww. Aww. He's a sweet guy, though. He's they always doing, are. He's doing the best that he can. Yes. Like the rest of us. Yes. And who are we to know? Who do we to know? We never know. And we don't know what makes people do certain... You can also tell them to stop it, too. Like, I don't want to sound like a bleeding heart here. Because I am very compassionate, but I'm also like, if you're going to do drugs, I can tell you to back off, buddy, too. Right? <laughs> That's why I said you yeah. can have both. You can have both. You can there. love someone. And, mm-hmm. Well, somebody taught me that, speaking of space. Mm. They told me that in order to love someone, you have to be able to get mad at them. Yeah, it's true. That was the free, most freeing thing. Because I always thought, oh, you had to be overly, ridiculously... No, coddling, coddling doesn't help anybody evolve. No, and it, when you get mad at someone, it gives a little space to be able to, like... Yeah, get them up. Yeah. Get your ass up. And protect yourself. Like, feel your own value. You're like, I'm mad because I'm valuable and you can't treat me like that. Exactly. This is the line. And this is the line. And you're a habitual line crosser. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then you find out that you can make the line squiggly. Too. <laughs> and then you're like, what? I thought first you learn how to make the line very sharp. <laughs> and then you're like, now you can make it squiggly. Yeah. Now it can be and now little... push the line way over to your yes. side. <laughs> All right, so you grew up, oh, rough childhood, kind of, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. In the Lower East Side. Mom Mm -hmm. was a public school teacher. Your brother's how much younger? Seven years younger than me. And did she choose to have the... Yeah, I think so. I think she chose to have... Wait, the home birth or the kid? Yeah, the home birth. (laughs) The home birth. Uh, Yeah, um, like, planned it out. She had a midwife or a doula, whatever it's called, when Mm -hmm. they're there to help you give birth. And then I cut the umbilical cord. Oh, my God, I was just going to ask you. Right. I was going to say, were you home? I was home. It happened right as I came out from school. I was there. I came down and cut the umbilical cord. Um, so you're seven years old. Your mom, was she in the tub? They do it in the tub, don't they? The, she did it on the couch. Oh, nice. With a, with a big plastic bag over the couch. <laughs> Ghetto style. <laughs> Jules, I had no idea or any of it. Pop that kid out. <laughs> Love you even more. Say it for the sun style. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm coming to join you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so were you completely horrified even though you did it? No, I mean, they've been warning me. They've been telling me, like, this is what's going to happen. And and to be honest, I don't really remember it so much. I remember there being, a, like, a bucket for the stuff, the undesirable things to go into the bucket. And, like, and goo and all those things. And then um, I... they. I have a very vague mem- memory of cutting the umbilical cord. Mostly it's based on them saying, don't you remember yeah, cutting your brother? 
I'm like, I smile and I say yes, but I don't really remember. Right. Yeah, I always wonder that. My my memories from my childhood are like stories that they told you, like, because I was born, they gave me my last rites when I was born, like a month, oh. month or so, they thought I was going to die. And I always wonder, like, am I strong because of that story or because mm-hmm. they told the story? Right. Am I strong because I fought or because my father told me the story my whole life growing up and did yeah. that give me? I guess it doesn't really matter. No, as long as you feel strong. You feel yes, strong? Yes, I feel strong. You look pretty strong. You've been working out? <laughs> yeah, I've been working out. <laughs> Matt Dillon did that one day. Careful, careful. He did. He came up and he rubbed my arm. He's like, oh, you look good. You've been working out. I'm like, what am I, German? <laughs> Get off of me, Matt. <laughs> Eating bread, working out? Yeah, he like rubbed my arm. He's like, you look good. So you've been working out? I'm like, oh. Oh, creepy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. God bless Matt Dillon. God bless that man. Yeah. You know, I don't really know... Um, and tell me if I'm thinking the wrong person. But did Matt Dillon do the Bukowski movie? Yes. I love that movie. He directed it. I he think. directed it? I think he did, yeah. I really enjoyed it. I've that never movie. seen it. I should watch it now. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's dark. Yeah. But I, I, I'm i a fan of Bukowski's writing, and so I like that. I really... And I didn't realize it was about him when I watched it. Oh. I like, I somehow I didn't put it all together. But then... um. What well, no. makes sense? Because Bukowski was like a drunk and like drunk and a, a, a really depressive, manic depressive mess. And do you think that has anything to do with your dad? <laughs> Me liking the movie. <laughs> well, I also well, like Bukowski. happy things. In yes, life. but I'm not. I wasn't saying that. I was just. I'm like. I, as you were saying, the reason why I asked that is because I was thinking. No, my dad was cocaine. Oh, but we uh, love uh-huh. anybody who's had anybody in their family mm-hmm. who had drug addiction or alcohol. We love them. Regardless, there's a tremendous amount of love. Well, I, th- I think there, well, like we were talking about, I think there's different kinds of love. Sometimes you have to love somebody from a distance. Mm-hmm. And like, I love my dad to death, but I can't really spend longer than 20 or 30 minutes with him. He drives you crazy. Absolutely nuts. <laughs> no matter how much yoga you do. Uh, <laughs> if you well, didn't do yoga, it would be only two minutes. It would be like two minutes. <laughs> I mean, Ram Dass has this um, great saying. He says, if you think you're a spiritual person, try spending a weekend with your family. And then that will be your litmus test for how spiritual really you have evolved. Okay, speaking of Ram Dass, mm-hmm. uh, Judd Apatow tweeted last night, I don't know if he... I can never tell if he's being a wise-ass or not. I don't know who that is. Judd Apatow's the guy who does uh, This Is 40, all those movies with his wife. And, okay. Well, he, he tweeted... I can't tell if he makes fun of it or if he really likes them. I still haven't figured it out. But so I watched... He, t- he said, watch this video, and it's called Fierce Grace, and it's about... Oh, yeah, it's his do- documentary about him. Having a stroke. Yeah, having a stroke. Mm-hmm. What is... What, if anybody... Everybody, you should watch that movie because... Fierce Grace, it's an amazing movie. It really documents... Um, you know, somebody who talks about contemplating death and preparing for death and then having a stroke and being like, shit, I'm going to die. I'm dying. I'm having a stroke. <laughs> and it's, you know, I don't want to give it away, but it's a, it's a tremendously powerful movie. Well, the fact that he said that he was, he was a spiritual girl. The, the, the one thing I will say is, first of all, he has a Boston accent. Who does? Ron Dawson? Yes. It's because he has a stroke. It's because he's from Boston. <laughs> it's because he's had a stroke. It's because he's from Boston. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm watching it and I'm thinking he has a Boston accent. And I'm like, no, I'm just obsessed with Boston. And then it, sure enough, he was born in Boston. His father was a big... Uh, yeah, where's Harvard? Harvard's in Cambridge. In Cambridge, yeah. Considered Boston, yeah. But it's outside of Boston. But, uh, yeah, like but yeah, so he's from... Well, but his dad, so he was a spiritual girl or whatever. They, you'll see the whole story about him that he was with Tim, Timothy Leary and they mm-hmm. took LSD. Well, they created LSD. They did? Mm-hmm. They created LSD. He was a professor at Harvard. They created LSD. They did all, and if they, Timothy Leary kind of came up with it, and he was working for Ram Dass, and um, they started working on all these other experiments. Started doing like giving people acid, and they got kicked out of Harvard. And he went on this huge talking tour around the states, giving people acid and talking about what is consciousness. The idea that consciousness is chemical, and uh, that eventually led him to have this beautiful insight. Which, you know, there's something more than what he can see and feel. And that went draw drew him to India. And that's when he met his guru. And he tells this really cool story in Fierce Grace about giving enough acid. I mean, he basically gave him enough hits to keep his guru high for a month. And nothing happened. Well, Mar- Mar- how do you say Maharaj? Maharaj. Maharaj. Neem so- Karoli Baba. But they call Maharaj is like great king or like great teacher. And so, and just the whole way he tells the story because... 
for me, even for anybody, when you start hearing somebody talking about this, it's like, all right, crazy, whatever. We already got a beard. You got, it's very easy to judge. Mm -hmm. But even his own dad. So he grew up with this wealthy father. They had like a farm, they called it. They didn't really farm things, but right. they had like big lots of acres and everything. And so he came back from India and he has on this long dress and this beard. And his dad is this conservative Boston lawyer. Mm -hmm. And everybody started flocking to the farm. Yeah. And my dad was like, yeah, look at all the people. They're having a nice time. I mean, my son... He's helping people, and I was like, the love for the father to have for us. I mean, he said when he got off the plane, the brother said when he got off the plane and he was had his beard and his dress on, the father was like, got back in the car and tried to hide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rondo said his parents mourned for him as if he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> but still, but the father still let him have have all these people on his land. Yeah, and it gave rise to somebody that a lot of people might recognize from the yoga world, Krishna Das. Yes. Krishna Das fell in love with Ram Das and started spending time at the farm before he went to India and found his teacher. And he, he chants. Chants. Uh, Chant he chanted. So, uh, but the thing that Ram Das said, which was so awesome, was like, he's like, here I am teaching and preaching about spirituality. He said, and then I have a stroke and I don't even think of my consciousness. I think of the pipes and I think, oh, I got more work to do. <laughs> That's so fascinating. This yeah. whole, like, you know, we can just become who we think we are. He thinks he's a spiritual leader, preacher, whatever. And then all of a sudden it happens to him. Yeah. And then he says he found more peace. And a stroke. It's amazing. Stroke of insight, he calls it. Yeah, he's like, I got stroked. I got stroked. God stroked me. But, I mean, the movie is just... So you watched it. I did watch oh, it. Nice. After the tweet or before the tweet? After the tweet, as soon as Judd tweeted it. But I, and then I listened to one of his talks on the uh, oh yeah all night last night. Well, because what happened in Boston last week was mm -hmm. really stressful, and so I stayed in last night. So now it's Saturday. This won't this won't drop until two weeks from now. But today, as we're doing the podcast, it's Saturday. I mean, it's Sunday. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> Friday today. night they caught the uh, the the suspect, the second suspect, and the okay. bombing. So. Last night, I just literally just stayed in and listened to Ram Dass and watched the movie. And he was That's talking great. about even after you died, that people are still there and that the body and it just got, gave me a lot of comfort. That's good. I never thought I would become this kind of yogi person. <laughs> but I, I really am. Like even the young boy that died in the explosion, they showed a picture of him that said no and more. He's, and he's holding up like a yeah. sign that says no more war or something no, like that. No, I said no more hurting people. Please. No more hurting people. And I was like, oh, he already got, he, was he already, already knew. Gone. Yeah, he did know. Yeah, I saw that picture. It's really sweet. He knew though. And then you wonder, like that picture becomes a whole sign for the whole nation and mm -hmm. deep stuff. And I love, like, Ram Dass talks about being awake and then going back in, being awake and going back in. And so that brings us to the yoga. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you're a kid, you're seven, you cut the umbilical umbil umbil cord. cord, your mom's a public school teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, then we fast forward to age 13. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a very pivotal age very for pivotal everybody. Very pivotal age for everybody in the world. Um, and... I had been practicing yoga a little bit, but, you know, I grew up across the street from the projects in Fortune Avenue D during the 80s, early 90s. So it's not, like, really cool to tell people you practice yoga. Where'd you, you know? get the practice of the yoga from? Well, I have an aunt and uncle who are very much into it. Okay. Um, Sharon Gannon and David Life are yes, my aunt are. and uncle. Very much into it would be an understatement. Very much into it. <laughs> <laughs> they own. They own, operate, found, co-founders, creators, um... My aunt, my uncle, my teachers, my spiritual teachers there. So when I mess up, I, I really fuck up. <laughs> they, they founded Jiva Mukti They founded Jiva right? Mukti Yoga School. Which yeah. is where we are right now. Right Shout now. out to Jiva Mukti. Big up, big up, big up, big up. <laughs> um, and uh, so I've been practicing with them, but I always hung out with the older crowd. And so when I was 13, a friend of mine uh, shot himself and killed himself playing Russian roulette with his girlfriend. When you were 13? When I was 13. He loved me, he loved me not. He was a bit older. He was like 17. I had a bunch of other friends who were doing crazy stuff. A friend of mine got stabbed from his uh, pelvis to his sternum. Another friend got sent away for like five years. And so I was thinking, you know, I could keep going down this road or I could investigate yoga a little bit more. And even though I was young, yep. I want to know, he, uh -huh. he said yeah to me because my hands went up because <laughs> I have another question with my investigative reporter uh -huh. qualities. No, because I thought what... Something about the feelings that you because David and Sharon were like big, huge yoga. It wasn't just like they did yoga. They were like right. 
At the they were time. icons in, in basically New York City, also because David Life started this thing that was very hip in New York City called Life Cafe, which is if you've ever seen the show Rent, Rent takes place in Life Cafe. A That's large in the part East of Village, it, right? the it was in the East Village. It just recently closed, the end of an oh. era. Life Cafe closed. Um, but for a long time, it was where a lot of artists, uh, well known artists from this area, Lower East Side area, got their start. So my question was going to be, was it the good feelings that you got when you were in yoga or was it the only other option? No, it was a little bit, a little bit both, but the combination of those two things. Yoga showed me that I could create, like we were talking about before, space. And with space, I could make better decisions. And so I felt like a better decision would be to create even more space. And I asked David if I could go to India with him. So at 13, when, you were 13. when I was 13, so when I was 13, I went to India and I studied Ashtanga yoga with um, Patabi Joyce in Mysore, India for two months. Patabi and Ashtanga Joyce. is very, it's more rigid than... Oh, it's, it's, it's like a set regimented, practice. Regimented, yes, regimented, regimented is what I meant. Um, it's the same practice no matter where you go in the world, usually. And Patabi Joyce is known as one of the main exponents. I mean, he basically created this form of Ashtanga yoga physical practice. Um... And most people, when you think of Ashtanga Yoga, they think of this style that he taught. And then I, we did another traveling for a month. Um, and after about three months of India, I realized I hated yoga. I hated India. I hated being vegetarian. I didn't want to talk to my uncle anymore. I was done. <laughs> <laughs> he ran his course. I was done. <laughs> this shit sucks. Um... And I came back. I had a, the biggest, like, double bacon cheeseburger that I could mm-hmm. get and um, and you know, I, it was, it was great, but it was a little bit culture shock. You know, I grew up in New York city, which I think of as the city and India in 1995 was, you grew up in New York city and like across from the projects down yeah. the lower East side. Like that, that was like, that's a lot of culture shock. It's a lot of culture yeah. shock. Um, and it was beautiful. It's a beautiful trip in hindsight. And again, it, it did, it had the most profound effect and gave me so much space and, um, perspective because when you're from the city that so many people want to go to you think you're the shit <laughs> and then you go somewhere else and you realize kind of like this uh, Ram Dass saying or what you were saying about Ram Dass, you become this person who you think you are and fixed but there's so much more that you could be become and so that's what it did for me Open up my eyes well that's what I was doing before you even said that I was like Ram Dass says that we can just look at it differently we can just look at everything. Put you know how when you take a when a, when you're in a film or when you watch a film, if you focus in on one person, the other people get blurry. Yeah. He was saying that we can do that in our world, which is what I think yoga yeah. has done for me, and it's helped me see things more gently, yeah. eat more easily, more like put space, just calm down, take it down a notch, just breathe a little mm. bit. Don't make it worse. I told my mom that yesterday. Don't make it worse. If you can't make it better, don't make it worse. That's good advice. She loved it. My, and my mom's Boston tight. Like, she said, I like that too. I said that because we were talking about the world. Like, mm-hmm. how do you handle all this stuff? I said, right. I don't know, mom. I said, all I know is if I can't make anything better, I just try not to make it any worse. Look at that. Words of wisdom with Sue Costello. Well, because the yoga really works. I come from a neighborhood where if you, like, people used to be like, you hurt my feelings. And I'd be like, that's because you're a fucking loser. <laughs> like, that's how shut down I was. Covered up from who I really was underneath. It was just right. covering the mm-hmm. loving person that I had underneath. But the, yeah. the persona that I had created was so tough and so reactionary. And mm-hmm. we, Boston, we, everybody knows, we come from a place of fistfights. Mm-hmm. We had no impulse control because it was cultural. I mean, even my dad. My dad. Okay, so here's a little, I'll tell a little yoga story about mm-hmm. how, because yoga teaches you to try to slow down to witness. Mm-hmm. Witness your behavior because how many times do people act out and they're sorry and they feel bad about themselves and it gets perpetuated, right? right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I call Friday, Boston shut down. I call my mom. I go, hi, mom. Where's dad? She said, oh, he's at the airport. Jules, when I tell you I felt like my insides were going to drop out of my body, I felt like my insides were going to drop out of my body. I don't know if it was terror or anger or what it was, but I, I literally was like, how could he be that stupid? I'm like, what? I'm like, 
especially the airport. Like if somebody was going to strap a bomb on themselves and right. they could go to the airport. And so my mother got very nervous. I shouldn't have told you. And I, and I was able to hear her nervousness mm-hmm. and say to myself, Sue, don't make it worse. Don't make it worse. I said, don't take it out on mom. Mm-hmm. And she said, please don't tell your sister and your brother. Please don't tell your sister and your brother. And then I was like, how do I do what she wants me to do, but also value myself in this moment? Right. And I said, all right, mom. And I'm going on the record that that was really dumb. Okay, see. And she goes, and she goes like this. I go, and then I was hanging up and I go, I go, uh, mom, I go, what's on the record? She goes, that it was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to yoga. All right. I went to yoga. I was like, I don't even know what, I was, I was like, I have no control. I have no control. My father calls me when I get home. Didn't even cross my mind, he says. He's 72 <laughs> years old. Didn't even cross my mind. And I'm thinking, how could it not have crossed his mind? What is he talking about? And I'm like, okay, dad. He's like, plus one of them's dead and the other one I could take in a fight. <laughs> and inside I'm thinking, he's 72 years old. He can't take him in a fight. I'm like, so Boston, right? <laughs> And every, Where there's then, a will, there's a way. Right. So. See, even you. <laughs> everybody I tell the story to <laughs> says, I believe your father. And I was like, it was so humbling. Because I was like, whatever I was going to project, my own fear, my own control, mm-hmm. I just didn't do it. And not only that, but it was humbling to hear everybody say, your father's probably right. I was like, oh, so I wasn't even right. <laughs> and I was really like, wow, that's yoga. Because I could have called my sister. I could have called my brother. I could have gotten everybody in a frenzy. And we could have fed up. letters like, of anger, disappointment. Shame. 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 Oh, that's right. You went to Catholic school, right? Oh. <laughs> shame. It's the worst. It was like an IV to stay alive if you had shame. Your face being red constantly, blotches all over your neck. Uh, but yeah, so that's the yoga. That's what yoga has done for me. The yoga's so, about. So, okay, so you're 13. Yep, I'm 13. And um, you don't like it. You come back, you have the cheeseburger. I have the cheeseburger. I spend, I go back to my friends, hang out with my friends. I eventually hit 17. And I get arrested for a relatively serious crime. Three counts of armed robbery, two in the first degree, one in the third degree, in possession of a deadly weapon. And um, <laughs> I wish we could videotape your face right now. <laughs> I bet you don't think about that when you're sitting in my class, right? Like My jaw is like hitting the ground. Very rarely am I, am I speechless. <laughs> oh my gosh, the Caduceus is just completely... What? When you, we do you think about drugs? that when, when I'm giving meditation instruction? But I love, I mean, makes no, the story no. even richer, man. And not at all. Um, no drugs. You mm-hmm. just did it straight. Did you get, had your dad been arrested? Was there any? He was in jail at the time. Okay, so there was some sort of like uh, repetition of. Yeah, kind of, sort of. I mean, basically I grew up um, with a bunch of guys who, you know, they kind of, they make you feel like you're part of the family. Yeah. It's and, like a gang. Um, well, similar to, or you could say it was a gang. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, we did things like we would ride around and go to different high schools and, like, rob kids at different high schools, take their chains, and, you know, who needs a job when you can just, like, go around and steal shit? And um, it was a way of being accepted because I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not the biggest guy in the world. No, you're like I'm the same size small. as me. I'm kind of <laughs> um, But also, speaking to that, my nephew, who is six. Mm-hmm. I was going to do the podcast with him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, can anybody see me? Can anybody see me? Do I need to look cool? And I was like, oh my God, that starts at six. Yeah, it's rough. It's rough. I mean, it's it's literally just a way to find acceptance. Mm-hmm. Um, and that uh, paternal void, you could say. But I didn't, you know, of course I wasn't doing these Freudian connections at the time. And, no. um and then eventually... You probably didn't see the consequences either of what, like hurting people, uh, right? Yes and no. I mean, it's, after a while, it's like you said, you become closed off to that. You know that you're hurting people and you expect to get hurt in return. And so you try to get it done sooner than later. You know, like, let's just fight now. As opposed to, I'm going to see you after school. No, 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 none of that. Like, let's just do it now so we can be done. And um, we... Uh, I eventually... Pled guilty and um, got, uh, because I was 17, I got youth offender, so YO status. So I, I don't actually, um, like I can apply for a job and say that, because it's a felony, but I can apply for a job and say that I don't have a felony because it's sealed once I hit 21, nobody can see it. And you can vote. 
I can vote. I taught at the White House. Good. Um, That's amazing. Well, I can do all kinds can of stuff. Can we not skip over that? Yeah, we can come back to it. It'll, I want to come later. back in because that's like, I love stories of redemption and people turning themselves um, around. All right, well, why don't I just summarize the whole redemption song? I um, I eventually then started working at Jeeva Mukti once a week, cleaning the floors and uh, cutting mats. Yoga mats used to come on these big rolls. And so once a week, I would come in for six hours and I would just <laughs> cut yoga mats for about six, seven hours. Which is what? It's, um, it's Isn't a, that what Buddha tells you should start cleaning? Cleaning. And um, uh, Neem Karoli Baba, who's um, Ram Dass's guru, said, Ram Dass said, you know, how do I, how do I become happy? And uh, Maharaj said, uh, feed people, serve people. Give them, make them happy. And so I just would cut yoga mats every day, uh, every Wednesday. And um, then eventually worked in the boutique and then the front desk and the front desk manager and then uh, general manager of two locations, then CEO of franchising. Okay, we got to slow down a second because I want to know, did it scare the shit out of you when you got arrested? It must have because... Well, definitely when I was sitting in the holding cell and the public defender comes and he's like, you know, because I didn't have money for a lawyer. Right. And he comes and he has like six or seven thick files and he's like, what's your name again? And he's looking for my file and he says, you know, don't worry about it. You're looking at three to six, but with good behavior, you're out in uh, two and you go to green, which is a penitentiary for youth upstate. And I have a lot of friends who've been in and out of uh, youth detention centers and jails and the worst and adults as well. But the worst facilities are the youth facilities because they're still trying to prove themselves. And um, it can be... Who's trying to prove themselves? The facilities? Or the no, the young the yeah. young guys. And um, so they're a lot more rowdy. And um, whereas if you're in a, a jail with guys who are in their 50s and 60s, 40s, they're a little bit... They can be, not always, but they can be a little bit more like, I'm just here to do my time and get out. I'm not right. interested in like no trouble. I don't want to make anything worse. Yeah, I don't want to make. Yeah. <laughs> I can't make it better, but I don't have to make it worse. <laughs> to live by my philosophy. Yeah. Um, play your bunk. It's called play your bunk. And um, so definitely, I was freaking out. And actually, when I was sitting in the cell, I did kind of skip over an important part. There is um, there's a prayer to Saint Francis of Assisi. Yeah. Um. You know, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And so Sharon does a rendition of that. I was going to sing it. Yeah, do I it. Love uh, it. I love it. I do it all the time. I don't know the whole the whole thing, but... Where there is hatred, let, let me, me bring you love. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's faith, to bring, bring... Where there's doubt, bring faith in you. Oh, right. Master, grant that I should never see hey. so much to be consoled as to console. Say what? Oh, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved is to love with all my soul. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So she does, um, um, make me an instrument for thy will, not mine, but thine be done. Free me from anger, jealousy, and fear. So kind of sums it up into a short thing. And I don't remember her teaching it to me or hearing it anywhere, but I, I remember I had read it once because we have the chant books here at the yoga school and I was sitting in the cell and at first my mind kind of started freaking out. And then I sat down and I was like, you know, you just got to accept what I was going to happen and, and just, you know, deal with it. And, um, all of a sudden that chant came into my head, make me an instrument for, and I'm sitting around with like some hardcore guys and in myself, I'm trying to like stop that. Like, don't, don't sing that punk ass song. Make me an instrument for thy will, but you better shut up. Free me from anger, jealousy, and fear. I'm like, oh, this is gonna, they're going to smell it on me. <laughs> the vulnerability. <laughs> they're going to yeah, smell yeah. the vulnerability. Yeah. And, um, and I realized at that moment that everything that I was trying to do with um, selling drugs or hurting people or robbing people, whatever it was that I was doing, I could, 
I could achieve those same exact goals without having any, without anybody needing to suffer for it or me needing to put anybody down because a big part of my humor as a defense mechanism growing up was I w didn't always want to fight, but I could make you feel so bad and so small with my jokes that you didn't want to fight really because you had already lost. And so, um, I realized that I could be humorous in a way that didn't put people down. I could, I could have fun. I could go out. I could have ladies around me. I could do all these kinds of things without having to um, hurt someone or put somebody down. And, and you that realize was a huge. When? While I was sitting in the holding cell at 100 Center Street, waiting to see the judge um, in um, Central Bookings, and I was like. Make me an instrument for thy will. Shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Free me from anger, just the fear. You better shut the fuck up. And, um... A funny sketch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... So, as, and that's why as soon as I came out, I, um, I was still in high school. And high school once a week, they, you know, they... In New, in New York and I guess and maybe in some other places, you do community service. So you go to one establishment that has some kind of different take on life and I chose Jivamukti Yoga and I started you know basically helping out cleaning up and it's just so crazy okay so you had to do community service so you do that but that's exactly what the theory is with the Buddha is that you start small and you build from there you clean you humble yourself and then you mm -hmm. build up from there so it's built on like they say anything that's not built on a strong foundation will crumble mm -hmm. in our society nowadays they don't understand that they want everything no, they want the fast, end result now right and then they're so miserable. If they wanted that and that's the way they did it and they were happy, I'd be like, all right, well, you do it your way, I do it my way. But it right. doesn't work. Mm -mm. And to, to hold on, Ramda says, to be the flame and not let the flame waver during, when everything's going around. To be able to hold on to yourself in this kind of society yeah. where everybody's like, you want, you, you, and tempting, tempting, tempting you to, to sway from, I was thinking this morning that, the courage. I'm so proud to be from Boston, mm -hmm. but there are parts of Boston that weren't good. Like when you were just talking about being a, right. a criminal. If the criminals took their smarts and used them for good, they would do circles it around would be an everyone. Be incredible place. Because the criminal, what happens is the shame comes from the bad behavior, so they don't mm -hmm. have the strength to continue on. So if you can turn that on, and I never thought that I was going to take the balls that I grew in Boston <laughs> to be able to say my peaceful way of thinking. Yeah. You get made fun of a lot. <laughs> they like to pick at you and stuff. Like, you're not peaceful. I had a boyfriend. He was like, you're not peaceful. I was like, all right. What, why are you so mad? Why, why, why are you hating? Why are you making so mad? Why does it, why does me smiling or being kind? But, but, and I understand that though. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, the world can be a very miserable place. And I kind of joke around that oftentimes when people communicate with each other, it's about miserable things. Yes. <laughs> like, if you speak to a stranger, 90% 90, 90 chance it's about something miserable. Like, if you're on the train and you talk to a stranger, it's because somebody next to you stinks. Or if you're in the airport, you're never, like, on the immigration line speaking to somebody like... This is so great. Like, the, you know, the person <laughs> behind the immigration counter, I'm so glad they only have one person in Newark Airport. No, it's like, can you believe that they only have this or the weather's terrible today or did you hear what happened? And it's always so negative. And so um, being happy makes you different than other people and it makes them uncomfortable. Yeah, it's crazy. And it shows them something that they don't have. Even though it's so easy for them to get, it can make them uncomfortable. Like, what are you happy about? And it's fine too. Like they don't have to be happy either. Like I can be, that's what I'm learning too. It's like I was on the train and I had a, uh, this guy who was asking for food mm -hmm. and the guy that I knew had sat down beside me. I know him from the city. And, uh, so the guy, I had a kind bar in my bag. I was so excited that I had a kind bar because I was like, it has antioxidants in it. It's not just bread or whatever. Right, right. So I said to the guy who was asking for food, I gave it to him. He looked me in the eye and he thanked me in a way that I, no one had looked me in the eye in a long time. That's fantastic. So, the, And the guy beside me, you know what he says to me? Mm. Oh, there's your good deed for the day. Hater. But not even hater. I was like, I don't go through the day thinking what's my good deed for the day so that I'm done. I, I, and not only that, I, wasn't, I was just happy that the guy was going to get the antioxidants. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking about what it did for me. I mean, he's out in the streets and he needs to get his immune system strong. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> 
literally what I was thinking. And the guy said that to me. And I realized in that moment is that when I, that's when I used to cave. Because I thought I was weird. Mm-hmm. Because my first reaction isn't always about myself. It's most right. of the time about... And I'm not so devastated that the guy's homeless and he doesn't need it. It was just in the moment. Right. I wanted him to have... The, I was excited I had the kind back. And he looked, intended. he looked me in the eye and thanked me because it was pure. Yeah. And that guy. There's a good deed for the I was like, oh, and thing. that's what they, yeah, I guess you're right. Hey, you're a little bit like poop on me a little well, bit. Well, again, it's way to bring, people like to bring it down because then he doesn't have to feel like, where's my kind deed? Or it's only one kind deed of the day that I miss, no big deal. As opposed to like, no, you do a little bit kindness whenever you can. I would have done it 50,000 times if I had 50,000 kind bars or whatever needed. All right, we're starting a Kickstarter program. It's called <laughs> um, Gather Kind Bars and you give them out to random <laughs> no, people he, that are hungry. I was coming up the stairs from the train today. There's an old lady pushing a carriage. I was like, I got to help her. So I go, ma'am, I go, do you need help? She goes, yeah, but it's heavy. Literally, I thought she had like 17 pounds of cement in there. <laughs> and she was like pushing it against my leg. I like almost broke my leg. I was like, all right, this is not comfortable, but I'm helping the old lady. <laughs> well, there's also, then comes the idea of doing something to do it for the sake of doing it. Because you know and it feels like the right thing to do, regardless of what the outcome might be. Yes. And that's a very important aspect because what happens when you give something to somebody and they don't look you in the eye mm-hmm. or they're like where's my sandwich or like what am I supposed to do with these twigs these nuts and berries keep them I've had people that I've been kind to and they've not been kind to me you want to hear a really funny story yes and I'm okay. still kind to them so if anybody uses this for an advertising campaign you have to credit me or contact me some 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 way because this is the perfect commercial but I really hope it never comes because it's for the meat industry. So when I first became vegetarian, I didn't really know what to eat. So I was like eating shitty food all the time. And I went to, um, I went to a sandwich shop and I got like basically a salad sandwich and, but it was too big and I couldn't eat it. And so I saved it for later and I was going to Hunter College at the time and I was walking down and I was excited because I had my lunch with me and I was going and this homeless guy. And I'm walking with a friend, and this homeless guy, you know, he's asking money, food, anything helps. And so I'm like, all right. So I gave him this half a sandwich. And as I'm walking down, I hear, where's the meat? <laughs> and he flings the sandwich and hits my friend in her back. <laughs> and salad explodes all, all over both of us. Where's the meat? And I was like, oh, my gosh. Ungrateful bastard! But did you guys laugh? We laughed. We, we thought it was hilarious. Right. We thought it was hilarious. Right. And another time on the same street, Lexington. It's on Lexington. On and Hunter's like on sixty something. So it's like all these well-to-do homeless people. Right. Right. <laughs> and I was coming out of um, a fast food place, and I had only gotten fries because it's the only thing that they had that I could get. And this guy says, "Food, money, anything helps." And so I gave him some. I, I have this box, and I'm giving him the box, and he goes, "I hope it's not just French fries." <laughs> Hilarious. Oh, and you're like, that's man. all I got, brother. That's all I got. I don't got no kind, but I, was, I said, well, you know, I'll eat it. I was planning on eating it. <laughs> yes. But I, I don't have to give it to you. <laughs> the plan was for me to eat it yeah, and but... never have any experience with you. <laughs> yeah, but you got to just keep laughing because yeah. that's my, my it's, not an, it's not a reflection of you the way that they act. It's in the expression of what you do right. every day. And when people ask me, Sue, why are you happy? Why do you have that energy? I say, because I accepted my marching orders. Yeah. I always say that because I was like, all right, God, what do you want me to do? Or whoever you believe in. It doesn't even have to be God. It can be a spirit. It can be the tree. It can be anything. Whatever. The universe. I aligned with the energy of, yes, serving people and not for the purpose of serving myself, which exactly. in turn serves yourself. Exactly. It's crazy. Um, the Dalai Lama calls it enlightened self-interest. Yes. Isn't that a great saying? Enlightened yes. self-interest. You don't necessarily do it for yourself. You do it for the other person, but in the act of doing it for somebody else, you immediately benefit if you don't get attached to the outcome. Yeah, that's the most important thing. That's the key. Because if somebody... And sometimes it's painful. Like that boyfriend who was like, you, real peace and everything. He's a fireman and he works in down by where the bombs went off. Mm. And I'm telling you, I was shaking and I was like, I have to call him and tell him that I hope that he's okay. Did you? 
Aww. I did. I was so scared. What did I'm he like, say? He, he, I left a message. I was okay. so scared. I was like, please let the message come because he might yell at me and say I'm not really peaceful or whatever. <laughs> but I was like, if I'm going to continue to be who I want to be, just because he made fun of me and was mean to me. You yeah, can't shy away from your true No, feelings. but it was really, but it's funny how much courage it takes to do that, those kind of things. Like yeah. to not shut down because someone else is shut down. Mm-hmm. And usually, like I was going to say, I wasn't always like this. I was like like the guy that walked out of the yoga class that day. Remember we were doing yoga? Oh, yeah, yoga? yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we were dancing. We're in Jules' class and we're dancing. And he's making us be silly, like really silly. And even if you're a little uncomfortable with being silly, like that's why we're in yoga so we can do... Or even if you don't like it for a minute, it's only 10 minutes or something. You can that's get nice. by it. And so this guy with big tats and muscles walked out of the class, but not only walked out of the class, but like made a big scene and almost bumped into me when he was walking out of the class. And in the past, first of all, I would have been like, uh, I would have been like him initially. I would have been like, I would have been so scared. It would scared me. Every time anybody wanted me to be vulnerable or goofy, I would get mad Mm -hmm. and puff up and actually hurt it. Like he almost hit me because of it. Yeah. And you hurt those around you. I had so much compassion for him. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, he'll come around. He'll come around. He'll be back. He'll be back shaking his tushy. In somebody else's class. No, he'll come back. He will. I'm telling you. He'll come back and he'll shake his tushy. But the other thing is for you to not stop d- teaching your dancing either because yeah, of not that. Gonna, not no. Stop. And I just, I identified with him so much because that was so much how we grew up. Like, I would get so mad. And I think that is what happens with people sometimes if you're kind to them. It, it, it makes them mad because it's hard to handle. Yeah. If you don't like yourself and somebody's kind to you, it makes you mad. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, well, then you should be even kinder. And I don't mean like chase people around and hug and kiss them <laughs> when they don't want to be hugged and kissed, but just show up and do the, like, leave a message for somebody. Because yeah. I was like, that must have been intense, regardless if I ever hear from that guy or not. Like, Yeah, and the idea, again, about creating space and renouncing the fruits of your actions, I mean, so much fear is built up on what we think the outcome will be. Like you were saying about thinking you were right about your dad and like how freeing it was to not necessarily be right and when you start off as a stiff person and you think to yourself I'm a stiff person and then like a few months later you're less stiff and then all of a sudden you're a flexible person you you find that the world is malleable you can change it well and also this is what I find if I act on fear I actually make the fear come true Mm -hmm. that's what happened when my dad driving to the airport Mm. I would have why was he driving to the airport? He had to pick somebody up. Oh, okay. And he's, you know, boss, he's doing mm-hmm. his duty. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to be scared. He's a guy. And I'm also not a guy. I don't know how guys, all the guys I told were like, yes. But you have balls though, right? I got balls. Okay. They're tucked away. <laughs> tucked away. <laughs> just put them in. All right, we have, we have a little while left. I want to just talk about yoga. Okay. And not too in, in depth because all I right. want people who are listening to just get an idea of what it is that yoga, what it, you're right, it loosens you up. It loosens you up. But it's a meditation too. I find it's a it's a. You can't meditate if you're all if you're tight ass. No. You can't meditate if you're like "Ah, next week. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do this week? Oh, this person, that person, that phone conversation I had this morning. You can't meditate with your mind doing that. Well, you can't also handle your life unless you're in the moment. Because if you think about it, if you're projecting, you're not handling like like even when you said when you were in jail, you're like okay. You have to like accept first. You have to become aware of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Then you have to accept it, and then you can do something about it. People try to go from like being aware to just doing something. You can teach the class for me later today. I can. <laughs> <laughs> can you see the yoga instructor? But no. What about my hips? My hips were. Oh, your hips, your hips and hips and tight. Hips. And then I just a couple of weeks ago, you were like, "What are you been you cheating on me?" Showed up to class, and I thought you were with another yoga teacher, <laughs> making me very upset. <laughs> it's because it's going along with my life. It really it's fantastic. Because I've held my my ass cheeks and my hip flexors like that fight or flight yeah I've been in that my entire life yeah a lot of people walk around like that I don't have a problem you have a problem you know their ass is pulled in their abdomen's engaged their hands are balled up into a fist and so the first thing like you said is realizing it so the the asanas are the different postures and so the different postures show us where we're resisting where are we holding on where are we not able to let go and that's like you said that's step one Let's get in there. Let's move around. Let's find out where I'm uncomfortable. Where am I holding on? What is connected to that? Well, it's also a very big, like, as soon as you walk in and you get on your mat, it's like a really 
loving self-care thing to do for yourself mm -hmm. and people are like i don't like it yeah i just like you started you went to uh india and then you didn't like it and then you went back and you went back it's like what ram does is about waking up and then going back in waking up like that's what i feel like that's how growth should be it should be gentle you shouldn't just wake yourself up too quickly because mm -hmm. i know for me when i first started yoga i would go and then i would quit right. and then i would go and then i would quit because it was intense to open up my body i had a guy in l.a He used to call me. He's like, Sue, I go to yoga and I love it. And then two hours later, I'm in a fucking rage. And I'm like, yeah. And I don't know if it's that you hold your emotions in your muscles or you hold your muscles to squish your emotions. It's again, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Chicken right. or the egg. But when you move your body in a way that, that you psychologically think that you're protecting yourself and then you stretch it, sure. you feel scared and vulnerable. Yeah. And that makes you upset. But then you get like, then you get strong and peaceful mm. and then you can be playful. That's right. And then you can dance. Jump around. You can dance around. Shake it out. But people can see it even when I'm on stage. Like, I'm very... It's funny because even Ram Dass said he's like, you're not supposed to be attached to your body. But I feel like your body is the home of the spirit while you're alive. So why not make it be as comfortable as it can possibly yeah. be? I mean, there's there's the extreme also with yoga. And they say, you're not your body and mind. But you have a body and mind. And so what does that mean for the everyday person? It's like, don't get so wrapped up in your bodily appearance oh, yeah. that you're freaking out if something does, isn't exactly like you want it. But at the same time, it doesn't mean you walk around looking like shit either. You know, you have to walk that fine line. Well, and a lot of people nowadays are from the neck up. Mm -hmm. They're not even aware of like what they're putting in their bodies or how they like the food or... Mm -hmm. It's funny, I tried to not eat meat for a little while and my body really freaked out. Bad. I'm sure. Some people can't do it necessarily. Some people have to take... That's a good, I mean, it's like it's like anything else. You got to go slow. Yeah. You got to figure it out. Because, um, like I said, when I first became veggie, I was eating baked potatoes, French fries, potato chips, boiled nothing potatoes, healthy, nothing healthy. Yeah. And I, because I didn't know what I was doing, and I felt like shit. And I thought, oh, it's because I'm being vegetarian. No, it's because I was eating terrible food. Right. And I needed to figure out a way around that. So it took me a little while, but I did it. And not, that's not to say that everybody has to do anything. Anything ever. But just the idea of actually taking a moment to care about yourself in one way and become aware. Yeah, contemplate what it is you're putting in your in body. In your body. My friend started to do that a lot. Like, she wasn't aware at all, and she's like, the chemicals and the yeah. and how much it affects your brain. And it's, like, so complicated, and it takes forever, and nobody's going to do it overnight. Mm -hmm. But the idea, like, that idea of... And yoga might not be for everybody either. They might no. have to do some other thing, but something about taking care of your body and the act of, like, being aware that... You have a right as a human being to take care of your body yeah, and to not feel sure. bad all the time. Because I think that has to do with how people act too. If they physically feel bad. You don't want to do anything. And you don't want to talk to people and you don't want to be generous and you're too grumpy. And you know, and you just want to get through the day. Yeah. a lot. That's of the just... worst feeling ever. I'm just trying to get through the day. <laughs> you know, I used, to, I used to work construction. <laughs> I think I, a lot of people just think that. They're going to Friday. They're going to Friday. I used to work be in the Iron Workers Union. And so I did um, structural reinforcement for concrete buildings, like in foundations. Which is, okay, can I just say, didn't we say anything that's not built on a strong a foundation? foundation that's crumble. right. That's right. So I did foundation did work for a long time. Ways. And um, I had this guy who every day, like, Jules, you know what they say, kid, better off dead. Better off dead. <laughs> it was, was like his mantra. Mm. And he was joking around. Baby. But to a certain extent, you know, you say something enough times, you, you believe it. And, um, he, you know, he was just like, his body didn't move in a certain way. Like, he was a carpenter. So, it's like, anything outside of swinging a hammer or carrying a two-by-four, he was like, nah. <laughs> I understand it, though, because I was so, I'm talented. The first time when I ever did yoga at the YMCA and I lifted my my leg into my arms like a cradle that's that's no move that's nothing i cried for like six hours six hours i lifted my leg and i cried for six hours so i understand why people don't Definitely. it takes a while but it but it is so and then all of a sudden now i do yoga all the time and it's not even a, a question not even, no it's not even a discipline i'm not worried about it I just and now you feel anything. maybe now even you feel when you haven't been practicing i feel great no, but like, let's say you go a couple of days without or a week without. Oh, I get like, a little oh, tight. Yeah, 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 I, I get feel tight. it. And then I'm like, I don't know, I get in a bad mood. Yeah, and then you do, you, then you, and then after class, you're like, ah. but people say to me, and they say, and I'm not a big, whatever, if you look your age, what, I don't even give a fuck about the age stuff. It's stupid to me. But uh, they do say, like, how old are you? 
And I don't even necessarily think it's about the looks. I think it's the energy. Because mm-hmm. they think if, if you're getting older, aren't you supposed to be getting grumpier? <laughs> I hope not. No, I'm telling you. I just came from the hospital. I visited my friend's mother and this girl was on the elevator. She had a cane. She's like, you got to smoke? I was like, no, I quit a while ago. She's like, I'm like, I'm sure somebody on the street will give you one. And then I walked out and uh, she had the cigarette in her hand. She was on the phone. I gave her the thumbs up and she's like, you have a good day. Safe home, babe. And I was like, <laughs> people really respond. Yeah, they do. And this was a tough girl too. And she was like, you have a good day, babe. And I was like, people are really nice to me. That's true. That's because you're nice to people. It's I'm Because te- I always try to... Not try to. I leave people with something because yeah. I like to have a human experience. It fuels me. One of the one of the things that we do, you know, we communicate with each other so much, but on a superficial level. So, like, let's say you walk into a store, and it's the person's job to say, "How are you doing today?" But they don't necessarily care. Um, or you're in a restaurant, you say, "But if you say something like best day of my life," <laughs> the person looks at you like, "Really? <laughs> oh, maybe me too. I don't know. I haven't checked in yet." Yeah. And like you, when somebody asks me how my day is, I take that to, as a reminder, that shit's fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. Like everything is incredible if I choose to see it that way. Mm-hmm. But, um. That doesn't mean you don't get grumpy. Yeah, I get grumpy all the time. When I get grumpy, I just try to sit still. Because I know it'll pass. That's what I mean. Don't make it worse. Just a little dark, bit of dark humor comes out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we need <laughs> some dark humor. Believe me. People listening are like, all right, Caduzzi. Caduzzi, get over it. <laughs> all right with you, fluffing on right, <laughs> See, I don't take myself too seriously either. Perfect. I don't care. I just do what I need to do for myself to be who I am. But I'll tell you, my Kickstarter, I did it. High five. Isn't that awesome, High though? High five. I donated to it. You did, and you I also donated. put it up on your Facebook, which I you swear. don't usually do a I lot, really and I appreciate do. that. And it got shared a few times from but there and all that. But look at that. I'm moving people who don't even usually do. You see? Like you're getting that. me to be a more generous person. See? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm telling you, and I'm doing it slowly. Like, I did that little bit amount of money, and I'm going to put that. And, and so people are going to be able to be involved and engage and see what I'm doing and be part of it. And like, Fantastic. I'm really doing it, and I'm doing it slow. All right. Instead of trying to go right to the result. Mm-hmm. The result would be that I would love for it to be for everybody in the world to be able to see me do my show. And I think everybody in the world would benefit from that. But if I do it slowly, it will mean something. I'll cherish it. And I'll tell you, people really respond when I say how much it means to me. Because it means everything to me. I love the craft of it, working with Rico. Just I found him slowly. I don't know who Rico is. Rico is my director, Rico Colantoni. And he's just... I talked to him on the phone the other day. We just, when we're together... I, I said this to him. The last time I worked with him in L.A., I left, I went and got a bagel, I sat in the car, and I had the most... You got a what? A bagel. (laughs) No, that's not what you said. (laughs) I did, I said bagel. (laughs) Didn't I I say bagel? Bagel, bagel. I got a bagel. I got a bagel. (laughs) (laughs) And I let the joy swirl around in my body. And there was nothing glamorous about it. We were in some little place, nothing, and I was like, this is the most joy I've ever had in my career. All right. And so I'm trying to make sure that I... Don't let that flame Don't let it wiggle grow. one way or the other. Just keep it. It goes. You know the the great thing about a flame, and uh, Sri Brahmananda would do this. If you light a match yeah. and you hold it upright, the flame goes up. If I take the match and I turn it sideways, the flame still goes up. If I turn it upside down, the flame still, still goes, goes up. up. The point is to keep the flame on. That's you got to keep the work. fire burning. And keep usually, I burning. find it you got to keep the fire burning when it's not the first time you're kind. Sometimes you got to be like 17 times kind. Yeah. And people will finally like... This little light of mine. We're going to let it shine. This little light. Are we going to chant? Because I like to chant. Yeah, we want to chant. I don't know. I love all of it. I all like, of uh, it? Uh, what's my favorite one? Should I get a harmonium? Uh, no, what's the one that I... I can't think of it off the top of my head now. Think of it off the bottom. Off the bottom of my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love to chant. I don't know what I've ever thought I'd like to chant. I used to Local be so shy. Stuff, if you know, Bob and two, there's, um, I thought, were you about to say Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, hey, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
Fish neck I'm beans. just following yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what All we right. do in class, you guys. I love it, too. It's so... It's in the first time I ever did it. I was like, I'm not fucking chanting. I would just sit there. And then the next thing I knew, I looked over. You were wearing an Indian sari. <laughs> you had your face painted. <laughs> like, uh, uh, <laughs> well, Jules, this has just been an absolute mm-hmm. fucking pleasure. You're amazing. It's all facing you. are the most fucking famous person I know. <laughs> Come to Jeeva Mukti and see Jules, everybody. What about your Twitter? Jeeva Mukti. I don't have Facebook. Twitter, but I'm on Facebook. JulesFebre.com is my website. F A F E B R E dot com. Jules F E B R E on um, Facebook. I started a Twitter. I just never really did anything on it, so. Oh, uh, there's nothing there. But you got to start doing that. Can you teach me? Yeah, I will. Show me how to tweet. It. Yeah, and you got to tweet at tweet. me. Tweet at me, and then I'll tweet at you. I'll tweet at you. Yeah, yeah, we'll tweet together. <laughs> Get your tweet out of my face. But you guys, all you tough guys out there that are wondering, maybe, this guy was in jail. Whoa! <laughs> and, oh, you know, just real quick, I do a lot. I teach something called hip-hop asana, and I teach in probation centers, youth development programs, um... I did a program last year at Yoga General Conference where we raised a couple thousand dollars for Andrew Glover Youth Program. 94% of people that go to Andrew Glover stay out of jail. Oh, wow. Um, so it's a program that I had to go through when I was on probation. And um, so, you know, I take this to the streets. I'm out there in homeless shelters and youth development programs. So holler at your boy. You know, it's yoga in the streets. <laughs> holler at your boy. Holler All right, everybody. Boy. Peace All right. out. Peace out. Thanks, Jules. Bye.